<laughs> my thumbs are a little dark, so. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'm just going to read one of my own, and then I have a few that I'd, sh uh, I'd like to share uh, that I, I just like, and that my husband and I have a book, have a magazine that we publish. And this is a very small town kind of poem, yes? <laughs> It's called Black Friday at the Walmart. <laughs> the line stretches three and five abreast out the length of the 4 a.m. blackness. Huddled shivering, the wind stinging numb cheeks and red hands. Anxiously staring toward the light, pressing curses at latecomers' sly attempts to budge closer to the front. Ranks close and cold glare slice and repel them back. Some wield shopping carts as weapons, shove them into the backs of those ahead. Is that someone walking inside? Are they coming to the door? But no, not yet time, not yet. We've driven an hour and a half for this place <coughs> in line, full bladders heavy, and if we'd pee our pants, we'd be warm at least until it froze. <laughs> the talk is quiet. But I hear at least three ahead in the line mention the 52-inch flat-screen plasma TV that I want. And there's only four, and I despair that there'll be one for me, that I'll get there fast enough to get one. Is that someone inside walking to the door, walking to unlock the door behind which the lights shine? But no, not yet time, not yet. I know where the electronics department is, can run there, know where those 52-inch flat-screen plasma TVs that I want are, can picture them in my mind, right there on the high shelf in the back of the electronics department, in about the middle of the store, I can run there when they open the doors. Stay with me, I tell my son. Is that someone inside, walking to unlock the door to the light? We crowd a little closer, shopping, carts pressing backs, people leaning, but no, the light remains locked behind the door, along with my 52-inch flat-screen plasma TV, and I hear another mention it further up, and I taste the despair, but won't give up. And then the doors are open, and a hundred run in from the sides like rats in a chicken feeder, and anger flares into rage, and we are pushing and pressing and squeeze through the doors. I almost wish for the shopping cart ram, but then notice those with carts are jammed so tight they can't move. But I can run and dodge and make it back to electronics, but they're not there! None! And bitter disappointment swells my throat and carts jam the way. Has anyone seen the 52-inch flat-screen plasma TVs? Has anyone seen the 52-inch flat-screen plasma TVs? I think I saw them in the corner by the baby diapers. I squirm my way through the jumbled thrusting, twisted crowd and see them looming ahead. I put my hand on one and refuse to move. This one is mine! Another stakes her claim, and we just stand guard with our hands on them, refusing to move, fierce and focused. I know the manager, she says. I can get us a cart only. Will you hold mine, too? My other hand grips hers, and she's off. I'm not moving. Nobody try anything. I'm not moving. She brings the manager and cart, and he loads mine up, and I'm through the checkout in two minutes flat and out the doors. Only I don't know where my son is, and I don't even know <laughs> where the car is parked. I blink in the early dawn, and the manager looks expectantly at me, anxious to get this done. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. This is a poem by one of my students uh, a couple of years ago, and I was teaching an introduction to creative writing, and he um, was a math major, and he just needed a class out, outside of his, his major, and it's called After Math, After Math. And uh, whenever there's a hurricane, tornado, or a flood, they talk about the aftermath, destruction, gore, and blood. But still I wonder where on earth they ever found that word. To hear them talk of aftermath sounds really quite absurd. I wonder, did they think about derivatives and such while they were looking at a town a hurricane did touch? 
Perhaps an integration problem, problem crossed a person's mind while they were searching for disaster victims left behind. Maybe the rescue workers thought of groups and fields and rings while rescuing some people from the stuff disaster brings. Perhaps some people thought about defining vector space while people died much faster than the rescuers could pace. <coughs> Nature's fits can give us fear and pain sooner or later. Fear and pain from college level math is so much greater. Crying, screaming, and confusion all lie in our path. Broken souls are those that live within the aftermath. <laughs> uh, okay. This one's a little change of pace uh, by uh, David Lawrence. Thinking after, thinking about the afterlife. My wife is angry with me because I don't believe in Christ, and therefore won't go to heaven with her. She's Jewish. She thinks she is Christian. Our lives get mixed up in the cookie dough. I am lonely in my nuts. Give me the treat of seeing eternity with her, like we saw Tunisia on camels in 1970. That was a freak. Five dollars a day, like the guidebook said. If I lie and tell her that I believe in Christ, will God know that I am lying? How about if I talk myself into faith like I'm trying to fool a lie detector test isn't God smarter than a polygraph? Well, at least I could fool her. And if I really don't believe in God, it doesn't matter. Because we'll both be dead anyhow. And what if she's right and Christ does exist? What if I wake from my death waving to her, riding her throne in heaven as I am thrown down into an oven of flames because I don't believe? Do I really want to take that gamble? And can I fool God? Or can I fool myself, pass my own lie detector, and believe for a while until I get over the hump of death and see Christ? If I see him, is he there? Uh, if I see him, he is there, and I will no longer be an atheist, and I will be saved. And my wife will be happy because we will be together for an eternity of her telling me, I told you so. <laughs> This is a very short one called American Housewife, and it's uh, inspired by American Gothic, you know, the pitchfork, right? You're usually so much more composed. Your strawberry blonde wrapped up tighter. Your blue eyes needn't be so cross in the glow of his pitchfork and the shadow of his black dinner jacket covering blue overalls and a white button-up. Did you make your dress from window curtains when his dead on stare and furrowed brow said no? Go home to your red barn, pop your collar, take off his glasses and loosen that pitchfork grip. You can shake him. <laughs> okay, I just have one more. This one's called Open Mic Anywhere. He reads, his own words, like a preacher bound to convert we islanders, who study his gifts like seashells, some more whole than others. We taste them like coins, hold them up to moonlight, until he reads Yeats, and we fight in the tide for that perfect shell to wear at our pagan ears. Thank you. I think we're going to take like a 10-minute break. So if anybody wants to have a smoke.